Well, we have been um, studying the life of Elijah, and today is a very practical lesson that as we look at Elijah's life, I, I think it's something that all of us can learn from um, as we think about why is it that people get discouraged? Why do people get down? Why do we even believers who love Jesus and have the joy of the Lord in our hearts, some of us get down from time to time? And I just want to remind you before we start this part that, that Elijah um, is in is never in the Bible um, spoken of as somebody who was just a mess up, who didn't trust God. He was somebody who was powerful in prayer, who trusted God through all those things we've talked about so far. And the Old Testament compares um, some of the things that we're going to talk about today. Um, it, it compares those things to the outpouring of the Holy Spirit in the New Testament and, and Elijah's ability to, to deeply intercede for his nation and for the weather and for all kinds of things, miraculous things. Remember, he raised the widow's son with prayer, that God raised him, but it was Elijah who was able to trust and ask for that. And so Elijah, when we look at his life, um, I almost wonder if he were writing the Bible instead of the Holy Spirit, if he would have left out some of what we're going to talk about today, because none of us are proud to say, I got discouraged, I got down. I, you know, that's not what any of us want to have happen. But today we're going to look at Elijah and, and finish up the happy part. And then we're going to talk about a part, like I say, that maybe he just wasn't in the Bible, but it, we need to hear it. We need to understand that while we're on this life, we are human and we're susceptible to some things that we would rather not be um, affected by. If we look at 1 Kings chapter 18, verse 41, Elijah said to Ahab, Go up, eat and drink, for there's a sound of the rushing of rain. No, there wasn't a sound of the rushing of rain. It wasn't raining. And Ahab had to be told this because, really, there was no evidence of rain. And remember, God had sent Elijah to tell Ahab, okay, I'm going to let it rain again. But so far, we'd had that amazing miracle on Mount Carmel where fire fell from heaven, but it was still just dry as a bone. There was no water. There was no rain. There were no clouds in the sky. It, there was nothing apparent. So Ahab went up to eat and drink, and Elijah went up to the top of Mount Carmel, and he bowed himself down to the earth and put his face between his knees. Um, it, it just shows you, even though God had already told Elijah this was going to happen, we often think we don't need to pray about things that, that God has said would happen. God actually does want us to pray his will. And, and it was his will that it was going to rain, but Elijah um, bowed down so low, put his, his head, his face between his knees, and he said to his servant who was with him, go up now and look toward the sea. And he went up and looked and said, there's nothing. And he said, go again, go again, go again. He said it seven times. Poor servant keeps coming back saying nothing. And at the seventh time, he said, behold, a little cloud like a man's hand is rising from the sea. And he said, go up and say to Ahab, prepare your chariot and go down lest the rain stop you. Again, he's a prophet. He's telling him what is going to happen. Remember, Ahab's having lunch and just waiting and refreshing himself. And, and he sends his servant to let him know. Ahab's probably thinking, all right, <laughs> you know, but maybe he wasn't. Maybe he was just hopeful. I don't know. But in a little while, the heavens grew black with clouds and wind, and there was a great rain. And Ahab rode and went to Jezreel. So he hadn't started quite in time. He must not have done it exactly when Elijah told him because he is caught out in the rain. And the hand of the Lord was on Elijah and he gathered up his garment and ran before Ahab to the entrance of Jezreel. 
So even though Ahab was in a chariot, um, Elijah just kept pace with that chariot and ran all the way. And Ahab um, told Jezebel all that Elijah had done and how he had killed all the prophets with a sword. Now think about Elijah the prophet, Elijah the preacher, Elijah the guy whose ministry it was to um, help Israel come back to God. If you were trying to think, well, what would make people believe the miracle that had just happened on Mount Carmel certainly should have done it if miracles are enough to bring people back to God. They had assented, the Lord, he is God. But we find even as we read through the Old Testament, the people weren't revived. <laughs> even though they saw the miracle in their hearts, they didn't begin to serve the Lord. And Elijah had a sense of that already. Um, we'll find that Jezebel, who, remember, had um, tried to kill all the prophets of the Lord and had brought in the false prophets from her hometown and was feeding them and taking care of them and basically sponsoring them and saying, this is our religion now. Jezebel, even though Ahab tells her what happened, she was just angry. She wasn't convinced. She wasn't like, oh my, maybe I'm off track on this. Really? That's what happened? No, she's angry. And she actually um, sent a messenger to Elijah saying, so may the gods do to me and more also, if I do not make your life as the life of one of them by this time tomorrow. So she was angry that her um, false prophets had been slain, and she committed almost with a curse-like promise to say, if I don't take you out by tomorrow, then um, let my life be taken. She was saying it as though she owed that to her um, false demonic gods. And verse 3 says that Elijah was afraid. Now think of all the things he's been through, and he wasn't afraid. But this woman says this really kind of, I don't know, possible, but kind of preposterous thing. Really? You think God can't protect Elijah after all of this that he's done? Obviously, God is behind Elijah, but he was afraid. And he rose and ran for his life and came to Beersheba, which belongs to Judah. And he left his servant there. So he left the, the northern kingdom of Israel and he went toward Judah, which actually at that time was not much friendlier to God, to um, their God, Jehovah. They had become quite um, out of touch with what God wanted. And Maybe not quite as bad as Israel, but, but we know it wasn't probably going to be much friendlier to him if, if um, Jezebel had um, sent a messenger and said, I'm looking for that Elijah guy. Help me find him. This is what he did. They probably would have helped um, her find him. But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat under a broom tree. A broom tree has kind of a curved shape to it and is really sort of like a giant umbrella. The, the branches hang curved down and it would be a shady kind of protected spot to be. And he sat under that tree and he asked that he might die, saying, it is enough. Now, O oh Lord, take away my life, for I am no better than my father's. So Elijah, you might justify it. And I've heard people say it. Well, he was just wanting to go to heaven. But really, he was praying for something that we as humans don't have a right to pray for. We don't have a right to say, okay, God, I'm done living. I've just had enough. Just take me out, please. I'm ready to go. And in fact, nowadays, when we're trying to assess, are you suicidal? Are you safe for us to let you go? We ask people, do you ever go to bed and, and hope that you don't wake up tomorrow? That's what we ask. And if you say, yeah, that happens to me, we think, uh-oh, this guy's at risk, you know, or this woman's at risk. And really, that's what Elijah was praying for. He was just saying, I've had enough. Now, think about it. He just ran for his life ran away from Jezebel, afraid, so he's trying to save his life. 
but he's asking God to take it. He's, he's in a muddle. He doesn't really know what he wants or what he's praying for, does he? And remember, this is Elijah. This isn't some, you know, barely baby believer. This is Elijah who knows and trusts God. This is someone who's had a mission in life, and he's, he's done everything God asked him. If you look back at those last few verses, God didn't tell Elijah to go down to Judah, did he? He didn't. Elijah ran away from where he was, almost as, as blatantly as Jonah ran away when, when God told him to go to Nineveh. It was almost as though Elijah was running from the success, because he was successful. If you wanted to define success, if you wanted to say, does this guy know how to pray and touch God? Nobody would be questioning that. He certainly does. That falling from heaven, fire from heaven thing would have been enough right there. But he had done many, many times had demonstrated that he was a man of prayer, that he, he knew God's voice, that he obeyed God, and that, that his whole life was about doing whatever it was God wanted him to do. It's what we pray um, for God to help us to do. Elijah was there. He was on, on task. And he was discouraged. And we don't exactly know why he was discouraged. Some of the things that he says um, to say, you know, it's enough. I'm no better than my father's. Well, I don't know what made him think he was better than his dad or his grandfather or his ancestors. But really what it says to an Israelite to say, I am no better than my father's. He's saying all these people who you demonstrated who you are, Lord, you demonstrated it to them. I am no better. I'm doubting. I'm, I'm in a spot where I'm just sort of discouraged and just feel like, wow, I thought God would have done something to Jezebel's heart or made this all fixed. And we had all this going on and God was supposedly trying to show Israel through the drought that they were spiritually dried up and lacking God. And, and, and that was the whole point, wasn't it, God, that Israel would be revived and he was taking on what he saw almost as a failure to minister as a prophet. He was taking that on to himself and feeling almost like, you, you let me down a bit there, God, and I'm discouraged, and I'm just, just let me die. I'm, I'm done working for you, he was saying. And he laid down and slept under that tree and under a broom tree, and behold, an angel touched him and said to him, arise and eat. We need to stop there for a minute and recognize that God hears us when we're discouraged. He doesn't just hear us when we are praying, interceding for others or for our world or for whatever it is God's putting in our heart. God is still with us and hears what really wasn't much of a prayer to just say, ask that he could die, but, but God heard it and cared about Elijah as a person, not just as who he was, the prophet of God, to do all those hard things he'd been doing. He cared about Elijah. He cares about people um, today who are feeling like, my life is a shambles. I, don't, I just don't want to live anymore. I'm so down. He hears that as a prayer. He hears it when people are at that point. Not just um, amazing prophets like Elijah, but people. Remember, James said, Elijah was a man like us. And it's important for us to realize that. And part of us realizing that is he got discouraged. We in the church very often have said, you know, just I've got the joy, joy, joy down in my heart, and that should be me all the time. And it is something we admire in people who are joyful, and we, we commiserate that some people seem to be gloomy and down a lot. But the thing is, you can be discouraged and still have Jesus in your heart. I think what this shows us, though, is that let God 
intervene. Let God fix it. Don't hold on to your discouragement as your new um, title. Elijah, uh, the prophet of discouragement and doom. God, that wasn't his his, um, plan for Elijah. I don't know, maybe Elijah got discouraged so that people like us could understand, wow, that can happen to people who are doing everything right. We often think, what did they do wrong? What did they go through that was a problem and they just didn't give it to God? Well, I don't think that was Elijah. I think almost the amazing hard, think of the hard work he had gone through, rebuilding the altar and cutting up the the bullock and, and, and getting all the water on, just the stress of all those people watching and and really, it could have been um, no fire. But he got what he prayed for. He got the fire. He amazed everyone. They said, the Lord is God. He, he um, prayed and, and just humbled himself before God. And the rain fell. The rain that was supposed to remind people that, that they were spiritually dry and, and, and that the Holy Spirit coming into their hearts again, them worshiping um, God is like that falling rain, just rain from heaven. There's nothing like it. But they don't give us the detail here, but we know from the rest of Scripture, people miss the message. And really, we cannot say that Elijah didn't do something right that God asked him to. We cannot say that God didn't do his part. But Elijah still winds up under this tree, discouraged, wanting to die. And God's response to that is to send an angel to wake him up and say, get up and have something to eat. And he looked, and behold, there was at his head a cake baked on hot stones and a jar of water. And he ate and drank and lay down again. And he doesn't jump up and feel all better. He lays down and sleeps again. You know, sleep is one of the things that God gives us. It's a gift to be able to sleep. If you sleep easily, you might not remember to thank God for that. But if you have even um, brief periods of insomnia, you will recognize that sleep is a gift. (laughs) It's amazing to be able to just shut out the world and go to sleep. And that doesn't mean we don't sometimes dream. We do. Sometimes our sleep is even interrupted by God telling us something. But sleep is a precious thing that God has um, made for us. And and it's a way to refresh and and renew. And God knew that Elijah needed sleep. He knew he needed something to eat and drink. Uh, But he wasn't all better yet. Sometimes we, you know, God could have just made Elijah better. Sometimes we pray that way about people who are discouraged or depressed or having a hard time. And we're expecting God to just perk them right up and be better. This is one of those times that God um, used a process to make people better And I'm not saying that God used this, but sometimes the process for us is to take um, medication. Sometimes it's to um, get counseling. Sometimes it's to take a vacation. Sometimes it is to do something different to evaluate and say, God, why am I discouraged? The practical part of this is always look to God as your source. God is your source to get through this. God is not to blame. And it will encourage um, more discouragement. (laughs) That sounded really weird. But anyway, you you will do worse if you fall into the muddle of thinking, God, you could have protected me from this. This is embarrassing. Here I am, you know, Elijah the prophet, and and I'm discouraged sitting under a broom tree, and you're going to write that in the Bible for everyone to read for the rest of my life, and that's who I am? That's not fair. But Elijah accepted God ministering to him. He just slept, he ate, he drank. The angel of the Lord um, came again a second time and touched him and said, Arise and eat, for the journey is too great for you. And you could think of that as where I want you to go next 
it's going to be too far and too hard for you to do it. You're not quite ready yet. You need to eat some more and drink some more. But really, you could also think of it as the journey that Elijah was on following exactly what God said was too great. It really was. He was human. Sometimes the things that we go through are are literally too much. Remember that God is your source. God did not answer Elijah's prayer and strike him dead because he was so ridiculous to have prayed that. People pray that. It's a prayer like an honest prayer from their heart. I just feel like this is too hard. I can't do this anymore, God. And I know life and death are in your hands. Help me out here. I can't do that anymore. God, in this case, strengthened him, gave him sleep, gave him something to eat. I I don't think Elijah had the strength at that point to hop up from the tree and go kill a rabbit or get something to eat or find a brook or do anything. God recognized he would just sit right there and do nothing. And and sometimes we get to that point where there is no more energy for this thing. And it is okay for you to honestly pray and say, God, I'm used up. I'm exhausted. I'm tired. I'm discouraged. And it's even okay if you feel that way. Be honest with God about it. He's not going to do some horrible thing to you and, and cast you out. He recognizes the the condition of our heart when we're discouraged, and it may not be you. You may be helping someone else who is discouraged honor the image of God in that person to say, okay, you're depressed. Let's talk to God about that. Not say, you're a Christian. You shouldn't be depressed. You should always be joyful. What's the matter with you? That tends to be the way the church has done it because it's kind of embarrassing. People outside of the church will think that, like, well, there goes you, big Jesus lover, follower of God, and you're discouraged. What's the matter with you? God does not speak to us like that. If you hear words like that, that's not God's voice. Shaming words come straight from the pit of hell, from the devil. That is not God's voice. God works with us in the same way that he worked with Elijah. He might actually send an angel to help you. He might send another believer to help you. He might send a non-believer to help you. He, he's sovereign. He works as he will. What we know for sure, though, is just like he cared about Elijah, he cares about you. He cares about me. He does not want us to just pretend and try to get through it. He wants us to share exactly how we feel and to expect that he is going to lift us up, that he's going to feed not just our physical body, but our spirit, that he's going to give us water that will be living water, not that we weren't saved before, but that will refresh us and help us to, to go on and not, God isn't expecting you to live depressed and discouraged all the time. God is, a, is more than able to handle whatever it is that concerns you. He's more than able. And people know this, but they, because they get in that blaming God, like you could have made this not happen. You could have helped me with this and you didn't. I guess you don't care much, huh? That, again, is not the way we approach God. We don't question him. The sinful world is not caused by him. It's caused by people. It's caused by sin. And it's hard to remember that. We hear people give testimonies that providence of God protected them from everything that might ever have happened to them. Well, that's wonderful for them. But sometimes God lets a deer hit our car or he he lets us make a goofy financial decision or he lets us do things or people do things to us and, and we get discouraged by it. Sometimes you can say, well, you weren't trusting God much, but not always. Sometimes people were doing everything they could to serve God, and they still can be discouraged. Sometimes it's um, 
like Job, remember when he was so down and scraping his boils and feeling miserable, um, Satan used his wife to put him down a little further and his friends to put him down a little further. Don't be a friend like that. <laughs> Don't assume that you have the mind of God all the time. You know everything about everything and, and that this should never be happening. Partner with people who are down and, and pray, trusting God, encouraging them, and, and lift them up. And Elijah, he arose and ate and drank, and he went in the strength of that food 40 days and 40 nights to Horeb, the Mount of God. Now, I don't know if he was singing, this is the day. I, I don't know if he was happy the whole way, 40 days. I don't know. But he was able to get up from under the tree and go. Sometimes, as I said, it's a process. Sometimes God um, allows us to go through times, and it doesn't feel like he just fixes it right away. And, and we wish that he would at the time, but but he knows what is best. And the food, it was supernatural food. It wasn't just something from the you know, market house. It was food that um, the angel prepared for him. It was supernatural food that gave him strength to go um, where now God wanted him to go. God is directing him. Mount Horeb is the other name for Mount Sinai. It's where um, his people received the law. It's a, a place, a historical place. It's, but it's not a place that Israel went and worshipped or that they had annual festivals there to remind them that God gave them the law. It's really outside of the promised land. They hadn't arrived in the promised land yet. And Elijah is heading toward this mountain, um, not knowing what the purpose that God is going to have. He's heading toward it again, almost of his own idea, but we know that God said, you don't have the strength for the journey. God knew where he was going to go. Elijah realized that somehow, some way, some distance had occurred between God and himself when he became afraid of and ran away from Jezebel. Now, most people would not hold it against Elijah to run away from Jezebel. She had a reputation of being mean and able to carry out what she wanted. Remember, she had killed all the prophets that Obadiah didn't save. They all lost their lives. She was a murdering, mean person. So we can't really fault <laughs> Elijah for being afraid of her per se, but he didn't stop and say, okay, God, what's next? You know, this lady's after me. She is going to get me. She has people to help her. I'm not safe here. He didn't do that. And he really didn't at this point say, so is it Horeb? Is that where I'm supposed to go? He just sort of went and God knows everything. God knew where he was going to go. He knew he was going to sit under the broom tree discouraged. He knew he was going to go on this far journey away. And he often allows us in an almost a permissive kind of way to let us sort of strike out and is it here? Is this the answer? Is this it? The answer is always God's way. But sometimes we have to learn that even when we're as amazing as Elijah at interceding, at, at lifting up our, our lives to God, at obeying God, sometimes when we find ourselves in just a place that's just sort of like, huh, how am I here? And, and we'll go on with that part of the, the amazing story next week. But for today, if it's you, if it's someone in your family, if it's a person you know about who just, we know there are people who have lost loved ones to suicide in our own um, community. We know people who have lost children in a horrible um, school shooting. We know um, people have just icky, cancery, bad diagnoses, some of them children. I am sure you know somebody who's discouraged. 
They may even be a believer. Even if they're not a believer, God cares about them and doesn't want to leave them discouraged. Today, God wants to supernaturally feed you. Fix your mind. If there are things in there that are not quite right, prejudices that people have have told you and that you believe about what it means to be discouraged, what it means to be depressed. Maybe it's you and you've been stuck just in this swampy mess of, I'm discouraged, God, can you help? Today, the answer is yes. God is saying, I can help. I want to help. I don't want to leave you there. I don't want your friend to be left there. I want to encourage you to be able to pray with your friend or pray for people that you know are discouraged and to pray for yourself and to trust me that Elijah was too discouraged to really even pray for himself. He wasn't saying, oh, God, help me. I'm so discouraged I could almost ask you. to to let me die. He did pray. He was that discouraged. It wasn't almost. He was there. He wanted to die. Today, God wants to um, teach us, show us, help us, so we don't get back to the point. I'm not saying you'll never be discouraged again, or they won't meet a discouraged person. He wants you to know that he is the answer that he wants to feed you, that he wants to give you refreshment, that he wants to give you sleep, that he wants you to be able to help other people who don't know how to get that, don't know how to ask God, don't think that he cares. He wants us to be the point people to help people who are discouraged. He wants us to be people who trust him and realize only God can really fix it. And it's not that he won't use things like other people and treatments, but he's the one who lifts us up. He's the one who gives us joy when we're going through stuff that is not fun and not good. He's the one who, in people that we admire, we just think, wow, they really have the joy of the Lord. They're happy even when nobody else would be happy. Nobody would be able to just praise God through that unless God supernaturally did it for them. And that's true. That it doesn't mean that you're a bad person <laughs> if you get discouraged. Doesn't mean that God doesn't love you. Doesn't mean that God wasn't looking out for you. We live in a sinful world, and there are things about it chronic pain and and setbacks and unfair things that will tend to make us discouraged. And sometimes it's success, like what Elijah was praying for. Sometimes getting just what you thought you wanted makes you discouraged. Whatever the cause, whatever the situation, God is the answer. And we have a responsibility when we see people who are down to pray for them, to encourage them, to lift them up, not to blame them, not to think we're the know-it-alls. God is. God is the one who knows all, not us. Let's pray. Lord, we do thank you and, and praise you that you left things like this for us to find in your word, that you, you can help us to see that things aren't as clear-cut as we thought they were, that even if we haven't been depressed or discouraged, that, that Elijah was, and he was a human just like us. He was a human who made you Lord of his life who served you well, who trusted you. And, and we do too, God. We're, we're human. And I just pray today that you, you fix us. You fix our thinking, that you show us your way to respond, your way to pray, your way. And show us, Lord, that you sometimes use um, doctors and counselors and medicine, and that you sometimes use food and vacation and rest and whatever it is you use, however it is that you 
Um, help us, Lord. We thank you for it. We, we aren't know-it-alls. We get it, God, that this is a, a big deal in our world right now and that there are plenty of people who need this truth, don't really understand it, are going to think this is too easy, too easy and won't even try it, God. But we are in a position to encourage them. And I thank you for that today. And we thank you, God, that you are the one who makes it possible for us to approach you, makes it possible for us to pray, makes it possible for us to go beyond what we can think or imagine. We love you, Jesus. Amen. I just encourage you to spend a bit of time, however much you and God decide, um, just praying, meditating, thinking for a bit. We have a song or two if you want that. If you don't, just kind of block it out. We'll try not to play it too loud. But don't leave this place till you've spoken and allowed the Holy Spirit to speak to you.